final word for March 23rd, 2001. Tonight, a story of murder among friends. A young man, his best friend, and the girl who came between them. A romantic triangle that left one boy dead, another accused, and a town divided. Colin was jealous. The prosecution claims they had motive, a murder weapon, a witness, and a suspect. He was my best friend. I have absolutely no doubt that Colin Wales killed Jimmy Dixon. I believe it, and the jury believes it. To this day? To the end of time. But Colin Wales has his own story. You want to hear about the monster? And there are some willing to listen. I just think that Colin's claim, it, it deserves to be taken seriously. He says that a monster killed Jimmy Dixon. An entire town thinks that monster is Colin Wales. Well, they're wrong. Emma Reed looks into a baffling crime and explores the shadowy subculture of internet-based paranormal investigators determined to prove the impossible. You think people should be afraid of the dark? They should be terrified. Oh, oh God! The Final Word with Dex Crawford and Cynthia Wyden. With reports by Chris Teller, Brenda Diaz, and Jay Pearson. And now from our studios in New York, Dex Crawford. Good evening. Two boys, best friends, met on a chilly night last December to settle a score concerning the girl they both loved. That confrontation ended in a bizarre murder that has left a town in shock and two families destroyed. Perhaps what was even more bizarre was the defense claimed by the boy accused of the crime a defense that was dismissed out of hand by the boy's own attorneys, but not by a small band of Internet entrepreneurs whose bread and butter is the stuff of nightmares. Here's Emma Reed. Here's where it all began. Belle Glade, Florida. Small, cozy. Perhaps even that quaint term sleepy might apply here. It's the Norman Rockwell kind of place most of us would like to come to when the pressure of city living becomes just too much, when the daily horrors of living in the 21st century finally take their toll. But what happens when that horror comes to a place like this? A horror so terrible, it stuns both the mind and the heart. But when we came here to answer that question, we found ourselves suddenly on the other side of the camera. What are you doing here? Excuse me, boys, but we're final word. We're trying to cover a story here. You guys aren't interested in the true story whatsoever. You, you guys are here just for grisly primetime entertainment. You're fodder between commercials. We're here to get a story, all right? We, well, we've all seen the show. It's on, what, eight nights eight a week nights now? Eight nights a week. Would you mind? Look, you guys run around, you try to be objective, but you, you're, you're not. really not. No, you, you tease it out, you twist it around, you lead us on, you pitch it this way, you pitch that it that way. way, and then you drop the noose to hang somebody for sweeps week. Is that what you're here for? To hang Colin? Colin Wales. The reason we came to Belle Glade. He and his family moved here 13 years ago. By all accounts, Colin Wales was an all-American boy. He grew up happy, played soccer, loved model cars and told anyone who would listen that what he wanted most was to be an astronaut. Why an astronaut? Because that's what his best friend Jimmy Dixon wanted to be. And for most of those 13 years, both boys lived here and played here. They were inseparable. They loved sports, football, basketball. But then he started changing. Changing how? His clothes, his habits. I thought it was just, um, I don't know. I went through this. We all do. It's called growing up, you know, the, the music. The rebellion. It's normal stuff. But it stopped being normal. Colin's life was taking a dark turn. He'd been accused of vandalizing the school, driving drunk, and stalking his best friend's girl, Tawny Lambert. Within four months of starting his junior year in high school, Jimmy Dixon would be dead. Stabbed 77 times one week before his 17th birthday. And his friend Colin Wales accused of his murder. Three months later, Colin was convicted. And because he was tried as an adult, sentenced to death in Florida's electric chair. But questions still remained. 
the weapon assumed to have been used in the murder, a medallion Colin had bought for himself just two weeks prior to the killing, had never been found. And there was the question of Colin's claim of innocence, his unwavering story that something inhuman killed Jimmy Dixon. That's the kill, Jimmy! Colin had some convinced. I know what I saw. Derek Barnes, a journalist in the loosest sense of the word. And he was about to take us on a journey none of us will ever forget. Neither will you. Coming up next on The Final Word. Maybe the villain is still out there. Several of Jimmy's internal organs had been eaten. Come on, Jason! Now what the hell was that? <laughs> More after this. Here we go. Who knows the internet contains a wealth of information. You can locate old friends, buy a book, or research almost anything, from pets to polar ice caps. But there are also websites devoted to less savory pursuits, to the strange, the bizarre, the supernatural. Who runs these sites? And what makes them tick? Once again, Emma Reed. Before coming to Belglade, Final Words producers spent weeks poring over police reports, trial transcripts, and newspaper articles. We intended to explore this crime and its impact from every angle, including Colin Wales' claim that it was a monster out of that fateful night's darkest shadows who took his friend's life. It was just too preposterous, too feeble a defense to be taken seriously. Or was it? It's not that, that we're here to get a convicted killer off death row. Then why are you here? It, it's like a what if. What if what? Well, what if he's telling the truth? We discovered that Colin Wales had a champion, someone willing to consider his claim of innocence. That champion was Derek Barnes, a surfer in both senses of the word, looking more like a beach bum than a knight in shining armor. He's the self-styled webmaster of an internet site called Freaky Links, a site devoted to the exploration, and some might say exploitation, of all things strange, bizarre, and supernatural. What's the harm in hearing him out? Don't you think it could be hurting the people left in Belglade, struggling to put their lives back together? What about Colin? I mean, his whole life has been trashed by this thing, don't you think? What about his life? Most people would say he's the villain of this piece. Maybe the villain is still out there. The monster? He said the flying monster. Perfect for your sight. Yeah, it's tailor-made. If I were shopping for an alibi, I don't think a flying monster from the sky killed my best friend would be my first choice. Not unless you believed it. And there are other believers. Derek's gathered a group of like-minded young investigators to assist him. Jason Tatum is Harvard-educated with a law degree. Chloe Tanner brings her degrees in folklore, myth studies, and social psychology to the pursuit of the strange. And Lon Williams, with a master's in computer science from Berkeley, keeps the technical side of things up and running. You know, for a bunch of highly educated ghost hunters, you all seem pretty normal. It's early, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do people take you seriously? Um, what people? <laughs> The people you're trying to convince. I don't think we're trying to convince anyone of anything. Yeah, we're just putting it out there. Skunk apes? Desert squids? If it's weird, we're on it. Weird, yes. But are they for real? Skunk apes? Prehistoric creatures? Radioactive kittens that glow in the dark? Most of your previous investigations have involved strange sightings, unexplained phenomena. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but everything seems designed for laughs. Well, yeah, well, it's a good time. But this time you're coming to the defense of a convicted killer. Yeah, but it, it's still a sighting. Colin Will saw it. Whatever it was. Yeah, and, and we're just trying to explain whatever it is. Perhaps it's just the desperate ramblings of a young man fighting to save his life. You know what? Whatever attacked us that night in the park wasn't anybody's desperate ramblings. You saw the tape. 
Jason and I were almost killed. The tape. One of many provided to us by Mr. Barnes and his team. It begins at Bell Glade Park, the scene of Jimmy Dixon's murder. It was hours after our first encounter with Derek and Jason. We had left to continue our interviews while they stayed behind to document the case for their website. All right, so... So they're fighting about some girl. The infamous Tawny. Exactly. It's after midnight, and they hear the sound kind of like an airplane. Some with a prop job, something like that. The thing comes out of the bushes, flies straight towards them, and they take off running. And they hide under the bleachers, bro, scared out of their wits. Whatever this thing is, it attacks. It knocks out Colin. Colin, gone, okay? And then it goes after Jimmy, and it gets him, and it kills him. Blood everywhere. When Colin comes to, there's cops all over the place, okay? And, and Jimmy's laying dead in the grass 50 feet over there. But Jimmy hadn't just been killed. He had been butchered. You have to understand that this was not a run-of-the-mill crime of passion. The coroner counted 77 distinct stab wounds on Jimmy Dixon's body. And there were even indications that several of Jimmy's internal organs had been eaten. Eaten? Partially devoured. Which organs? Kidneys, liver, and stomach. All of this cannibalism, Jimmy, he, he was eaten apart, okay? All of his blood and no murder weapon. And the little knife that Colin was supposed to have used? No way! Impossible! Yeah, and the forensics never conclusively stated that the wounds found on Jimmy Dixon's body were in fact made by a small blade. And why wasn't Colin drenched in blood? They didn't find a single drop of Jimmy Dixon's blood on him at all. And what about that witness, huh? Well, the English teacher said he didn't see anything. Which means the evidence was inconclusive. Exactly. Reasonable doubt? You might think so, but none of the inconsistencies in the evidence could explain away the eyewitness testimony. Police emergency. Yeah, there's uh, something wrong out in the park here. Where are you, sir? Bell Glade Park. I live across the street, and uh, someone's screaming up near the bleachers. Units are on the way. Is there a weapon involved that you can see? Can you see anything? I don't know. I saw two boys out there about 10, ten minutes ago, I guess. Two boys? Yeah, I, I think one of them was Colin. One of them is who? Colin Wales. He, he's in... I teach English at high school. He's, he's in my class. Seth Hubbard lived across the street from the park, close enough to hear almost everything that happened that night. Yeah? My, my wife's on sabbatical. Um, no, at any rate, after I got off the phone, I, I looked back in the park, and I saw the one boy on the ground. And uh, the police were pulling Colin out from underneath uh, the bleachers there. It was... Mm. The bleachers, a shadowy place where, for generations, kids have gone to do the things most parents wouldn't approve of. But murder? Collins claimed that it was a monster that killed his friend was about to gain some credibility. That is, if you believe an internet journalist eager to prove the impossible. Well, what if he's telling the truth? Which brings us back to the tape Derek Barnes and Jason Tatum shot that night under the bleachers. It contains several minutes of video that must be seen to be believed. Or not believed, depending on your point of view. What is that? What is that noise? I don't know, man. Get down. Now, what the hell was that? What, indeed. Whatever it was, it was gone. Into the night. Derek and Jason were sure that they had just been attacked by the same thing that killed Jimmy Dixon. Or had they? Was it a hoax? Something to help Colin's case? If so, who was behind it? Surely there's no such thing as monsters. I know what I saw. And it wasn't human. When the final word continues... We know we're not dealing with some giant flying creature. Sir, be careful. You got a bad feeling? Yep. <laughs> Me too. The final word will return after these messages. Once again, Dex Crawford. It began as an investigation into a small town murder. Now, final word has uncovered the efforts of a group of young reporters. Are they determined to free a convicted killer, or are they riding a wave of publicity for their own unscrupulous reasons? Whatever their motivation. It appeared that they had been the target of what they describe as a monster. You've seen their frightening video, but what exactly does it prove? Emma Reed continues with our story. 
What is that? Derek Barnes and Jason Tatum claim they experienced something unbelievable that night. And they even gave us the video to prove it. So that's what we set out to do. Well, it's digital. Uh, that means it's easy to manipulate. And you get almost no loss from repeated generations or adding or subtracting elements. Roger Spence is one of Hollywood's most sought-after special effects experts. If you've noticed his work on screen, then he's doing something wrong. What he does is create the impossible on a daily basis. And if you ever catch him at it... I'd probably just quit the business and open a trout farm in Oregon, I guess. <laughs> but what about this monster? Was this really a legitimate encounter with the paranormal? First off, we know we're not dealing with some giant flying creature. How can you tell? Well, because they don't exist. <laughs> um, the sound... Hear that? The droning. What is that noise? Mm -hmm. Sounds like some um, special sound effect from some World War II movie, doesn't it? Some lumbering bomber on its way to Berlin. Yes, now that you mention it. Probably sampled that from 30 seconds over Tokyo or something. Oh, and um, this is coming up. There. See that? That's a man in a suit. Roger Spence? That guy is a thief. Why is that? Wait, did you see his last movie? He stole the cost of a full price movie ticket right out of my wallet. Man, his effects, they, they suck. An imaginative young man. A website devoted to promoting the unbelievable. Were they really attempting to investigate a murder case? Or simply hitching a ride on this particular tragedy for their own selfish gain? They're vultures. You have to admit, they do bring up some interesting points. Like what? Like the forensics. The lack of a murder weapon. We know Colin's knife was used. But you never found it. And the opinion of some medical examiners is that the wounds on Jimmy Dixon's body could not have been caused by a knife that small. These were deep, deep wounds. There were 77 stab wounds. Now try taking a pot roast and stabbing it 77 times, and you tell me where one wound ends and another begins. Those wounds were so deep because nothing stopped Colin Wales' hand with that knife from penetrating deep into Jimmy's body. So you're confident there was no monster? <laughs> I have to ask. No, there, there was no monster. Uh, I'm fairly confident of that. But Derek Barnes and Freaky Links were not about to back down, determined to prove that what happened to them under the bleachers that night was in fact real. They sought out their own expert, someone who could either confirm or deny their outrageous claim. Got it? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm getting a good image here. Hey, Derek. It's nice to finally meet you in person. Yeah. I'm Chloe. You want to hear about the monster? Colin declined an interview with Final Word. But he did grant Derek and Chloe some time to discuss his version of the events. How are you holding up? I'm sorry. No, it's okay, man. He was my best friend. Yeah, we know. And the thing is still out there. Okay, look, uh, you're, you're an English teacher. Um, Mr. Hubbard. Yeah. He said that he didn't see any animal or any sort of creature attack you that night. Well, and he wasn't looking, I guess. But he, he said he did see you and Jimmy arguing. About Tom. We weren't arguing. I was mad at him because he was being an ass. What, to, to Tony? He was going to dump her. I told him that he shouldn't. I told him she was great. Well, she thinks that you were stalking her. 
Well, the prosecutor's got to believe in that. Do you love her? No. She's Jimmy's girlfriend. Okay. I told her to pull back a little. You know, maybe make Jimmy jealous. Get him back on track. By pretending to like you? <laughs> it was a dumb idea. So, that night in the park, did, did you see what attacked you? No. I just heard it. I think I was turning around to look. When I got hit, I got... I think I was knocked out. And then I heard Jimmy screaming. And I just ran. I ran under the bleachers. Did it sound like this? And once again, we found ourselves with more questions than answers. Was Colin's reaction real? Was he taking advantage of an opportunity to support his wild story? If there was a monster, or at least some rational explanation for what Derek and Jason experienced, could that explanation also help free a convicted killer? Earlier, you accused us of not being interested in the truth. Could I say the same about you? Um... We're just looking for answers. Isn't that the same thing? Well, it, it depends on the answer. If, if you ask Colin Wales what killed his friend, his answer would be some sort of flying monster, but... But if you ask the prosecutor who put him on death row... Exactly. And you think the truth lies somewhere in the middle? Um, I, I don't know. Maybe. So what's the truth about you? Me? <laughs> um, I'm just a guy that's trying to put cornflakes on the table. <laughs> well, why are you really doing this? Why are any of you here? Because we love what we do, and it's not a nine to five. <laughs> because this place would crash and burn without me. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> Chloe, how about you? Why are you here? <clears throat> well, um... The ability of human beings to create their own reality and believe that reality fascinates me. Do you sometimes believe what you encounter here? Well, sometimes it's hard not to. Doesn't your scientific objectivity go out the window at that point? No. Except during the case of a little boy suffering a post-traumatic disorder, after witnessing a brutal massacre in a fast food restaurant. According to Dr. Amy Gibson, the psychologist in charge of the case, Dr. Tanner was brought in to consult, but within days, she willfully transgressed ethical boundaries and put the boy's mental health at serious risk. She did this, according to Dr. Gibson, by allowing Freaky Link's access to patient files and other confidential information. That incident was settled. But your connection to Freaky Link's almost cost you your license, didn't it? I'm just giving you a chance to explain yourselves. No, that's not what you're doing at all. You're trying to make us look like the Manson family. And what are you going to do? You're going to drag out my DUI arrest next? Or, or, or Jason's bar fight? Jason knocked a man out. Hey, grow up lawn. What do you want me to do? Not that I couldn't have taken care of myself. Could we talk about Derek's twin brother, Adam? No, we can't. I'm just curious about it. I just said no. I said, I'm done. We just want to see how you go you about... You want to see how we work? Yes. Then let us work, all right? What's his name? Who? Your cameraman. Bob. And that's done on audio. How are you guys? Are you guys pretty light with all of that gear? We manage. Yeah? Well, then, let's drop the tripods and let's go investigate, okay? You want to hunt monsters? Let us work, follow us around, and try and keep up, okay? The gauntlet had been thrown. 
Freaky Links would give us full access to their tapes, and we promised to show whatever they eventually found. But Derek's decision to provide our cameras full access wasn't greeted with total acceptance. They're going to build you up and they're going to knock you down. You know what? That's happened before and I've landed on my feet before. And if that happens, I'll land on my feet again. This is different. Yeah, this is different. This is huge, Chloe. That's exactly what I'm trying to say, Derek. Any credibility what we have credibility? will be out the window. What are you doing? Keeping up. What? You. Come on. Oh, this is a tape from when you guys were under the bleachers. Well, what were you doing to it? Ah, oh, it's just fast forwarding. Okay, do it again. But Derek Barnes remained undaunted. Okay, now what's that sound like to you? I'm like flies, lots of them. Exactly. <laughs> okay, rewind it. Okay. Now play it back again normal speed, okay? Okay. Now what's that sound like to you? A big bug? A really big bug. So where are we going? We're gonna go look for a nest. Get your insect repellent. We found ourselves crisscrossing Belglade with the Freaky Links team. What we were looking for, believe it or not, was a giant insect. Wow. What, like a wasp? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just like just that. Like yeah. That. So, maybe if you're looking for a pack of wild dogs, I might be able to help you. <laughs> maybe next time. No? I mean, I see bugs and bees and the flowers. <laughs> and when it all seemed hopeless, we heard about Ed. Must be a bitchin' slow news day. <laughs> Might ask Ed. Uh, who's Ed? Ed. I usually find him by the dumpster out behind the Italian restaurant after 10 o'clock or so. Okay. He was talking about bugs, big mothers flying around uh, a few weeks ago. Uh-huh. Where, uh, where does Ed sleep? Abandoned building across town. The building was an unofficial residence for the area's homeless. A haven for squatters and drug addicts, condemned by the city of Belglade. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there's, there's a pretty bad smell coming from down here. <coughs> What's that smell like to you? Oh, God. It smells like a dead body. Oh. How would you know? Bosnia. It's been 14 months. Hey, D. Yo. Come check this out. What does this look like to you? That looks like pay dirt, bro. Oh. Oh, that is so weird. That thing is huge. Oh. Derek, be careful. At this point in the telling of our investigation, the producers of Final Word and the network that broadcasts this program have required me to warn you that what you are about to see is quite graphic and quite disturbing. We debated the merits of including the following footage but decided in the interest of public knowledge, it had to be shown. Again, I must warn you, what you are about to see may be quite upsetting. What is that? I don't hear anything. <gasps> it's moving. What? Oh. <gasps> wow. Okay, Bob, we should go. Let's go, let's go, guys. Now, wait a second. Was this another victim of Colin Wales? Or would this second body take our investigation in a direction no one was prepared to believe, except perhaps Derek Barnes? The final word will return in a moment. A three-time winner of the Armstrong Meredith Award for Journalistic Excellence. Here again is Dex Crawford. Now there were two victims. The latest found by the Freaky Links team in what appeared to be a giant insect nest. But was it really a nest? Or was it some creative, even duplicitous attempt at supporting Colin Whale's story of a giant flying monster? Was there a connection between this death and Jimmy Dixon's murder? Reporter Emma Reed continues. His name was Ed Bronson, homeless and living in Belglade for the last three years. The police sealed off the crime scene within minutes. No one was willing to talk on the record. Not even the normally effusive Derek Barnes. Colin Wales was a young man facing the electric chair after being convicted of murdering his best friend 
and Freaky Links had come to his defense with a story that now seemed to have some credence. The medical examiner confirmed that the dead man had been stabbed repeatedly and partially consumed, just like Jimmy Dixon. But did this substantiate Colin's monster defense or merely open the door to another potential murder case for the prosecution? Do you have any suspects? Colin Wales. How do you figure? Well, serial killers have been known to warm up to their need to kill by murdering homeless people. Colin isn't a serial killer, is he? Well, do we have any proof that he isn't? For all I know, there may be more bodies out there. Or maybe you stopped him in his tracks. I can only hope. So you believe he killed Ed Bronson, constructed an elaborate nest, and then set his sights on Jimmy Dixon? Absolutely. The body bears the same wounds, same signature. What if there was another killer? Another man, another woman, someone with their own pathology. Someone who crossed paths with Colin Wales and is willing to let him go to the electric chair for their crimes. No. No? No. It's people like the prosecutor that make cases like this so difficult. Um, you mean because of their skepticism? That and their ability to arrest us. <laughs> well, you've got to admit your theory is a bit out there. Yeah, so were Einstein's theories. I'm not that I'm comparing. So you have it in your possession? Great. Um, Derek. Frankie. Hey. <clears throat> a simple phone call was about to blow everything wide open. Okay. All right, then. Yeah? Yes. Okay, this is not for you. You cannot. I don't want any of this. Wait a second. No, I want what about our agreement? We have no. full disclosure, no. remember? No. Lon Williams attempted to meet an informer away from our cameras. We drove in circles for two hours. Derek had told Lon via cell phone that we were following her, and she tried to lose us repeatedly. We thought she'd succeeded until we spotted her car in a parking garage. We later learned that Lon Williams had managed to secure a copy of the sealed coroner's report from a county employee. So you have sources? Yeah. Are your informants on some kind of payroll? No. Why, we really don't have a payroll around here. <laughs> so why do they do it? Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe they want to believe in something. Like what? Something unbelievable. Payroll or no payroll, Freaky Links leapt into the evidence with their usual enthusiasm. Hey, check this out. The coroner retested Jimmy Dixon's tissues up. Can we got some more bug juice? Yeah, the kid was full of it. Yeah, and they ID'd it. Calcosoma caucus. Calca what? Calcosoma caucus, a beetle found in Southeast Asia, Malaysia to be precise. Researchers believe that its saliva could aid in the treatment of malignant tumors. You know, I really wouldn't call what happened to Jimmy and Ed a viable cancer treatment. All right. Check out the lead biologist. Hmm. Gloria Hubbard? Gloria Hubbard, wife of English teacher Seth Hubbard. Remember him? He was the 911 caller who alerted the police to the attack in Bell Glade Park. Where are you, sir? Bell Glade Park. I live across the street. Uh, someone's screaming up near the bleachers. He was also the prosecution's key witness. We'd begun our story in search of a motivation for murder and its painful aftermath. We soon found ourselves hunting for monsters. And Seth Hubbard seemed to be closely connected with the one person who knew them intimately, his wife. It's really interesting how things get interesting, isn't it? So the case was blown wide open. And when we come back, the dramatic conclusion. Continues. From our studios in New York, Dex Crawford. Returning to our story, if this case didn't have enough surprises, suddenly the prosecution's key witness, Seth Hubbard, was linked in not one, but two murders. Derek Barnes and the Freaky Links team set out to confront Hubbard. Was there a link? Would Colin and Whale's conviction be overturned? Would the prosecutor even consider a defense that hinged on the paranormal? Emma Reed takes us through this incredible story's final chapter. But be warned, things are about to take a frightening turn. As we followed the Freaky Links team to Hubbard's home, there was a sense that this was what Derek Barnes and his friends lived for. Are you nervous? 
Nervous about what? <laughs> All we're doing is asking some guy and his wife a couple of questions. What's there to be nervous about? <laughs> Hello? Well, should we maybe be a little less intimidating? We've got three cameras here. You know, I'll turn off mine if you turn off yours. No deal. Sorry, Chloe, I tried. Hey, it's Derek Barnes from Freaky Lake. I'm gonna look around back. Well, you're not going alone. Bird. Got a couple questions for you. Want to try knocking? You're doing fine. Can you feel it? What? We're onto something. Something dangerous. Been there, done that. What, hunting monsters? Yeah. The human kind. You got a bad feeling? Yep. You like it? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Hey, all the lights are out. I don't think anybody's home. Let's go back. Hello? Hello? Oh. Watch your step, guys. Hello? Hello, Mr. Hubbard? Hey, guys, come check this out. This window, it's like it's locked from the outside. Oh, oh. yeah. Look at the bars. They're all bent. Yeah, but from the inside. It's not like they're trying to keep burglars out. No, looks like they're trying to keep somebody in. Can you see anything? Yeah, a woman. What? A woman? Yeah. Hey! Not moving. Hey! Didn't Mr. Hubbard say his wife was on sabbatical? Yeah, but he didn't say where. <clears throat> Mrs. Hubbard? Mrs. Hubbard, we're here to help. Oh, my God. Is that blood? I'm thinking, yeah. Blood? Great. It goes in here. Okay, here we go. Mrs. Hubbard? Mrs. Hubbard? Mrs. Hubbard? Oh, God! Who is that? Is that his wife? I don't know. I'm not sure. I guess so. Looks like something hit her from the inside out. Where are you going? I'm going to go upstairs, see if Mr. Hubbard wants an interview. What? What? This is his dead wife. Do you think he really wants to chat? I think he's going to save Colin from death row. Jason, come with me. Bob, you stay here. Make sure everything's all right. Jay, can we get the flashlight? Yeah. All right, we need the police. Hello, yes. We're at 1454 Grand Avenue. Bob, over here. Your camera light. We have a dead body here. Colin's medallion. Wait a minute. The beetle. Wasn't Gloria Hubbard studying beetles for anti-cancer medicine? She wanted to help people. Yeah, I just want her to be free. She didn't mean to hurt Jimmy. Your wife killed Jimmy Dixon? Uh, the homeless man was, uh, that was an accident. It's just a mistake. She just wanted to help. That's why she went to the rainforest. Mr. Hubbard, what was she researching? What did she find? Well, she thought she found a cure. Ah, uh, she, uh, cross-typed her DNA with the insect. But the beetle... Uh, got inside of her. It's changed her. It killed her? No. No. She's not dead. <laughs> no, she's... She's not dead. This isn't her. She's... she's different now. Different? Yeah. Just how different our final word cameraman, Bob Schofield, was about to find out as he joined Daryl Barnes and Jason Tatum upstairs in the Hubbard's attic. What's that sound like to you, man? No, Let's keep looking. Missing out on the action, huh, Bob? You know it. Oh, D? Oh, my God. All right. 
right there. You cool? Yeah. Bob? Bob, you hit. You got hit. You okay? I'm all right. This is a little sketch. That was incredible. Did you guys see that? It was so incredible. It was over. The prosecutor had another case, but Derek Barnes had other ideas. Hubbard didn't kill anybody. Um, his wife left for sabbatical and came back with a bug problem. It, a DNA cross match, bizarro medical research, you can call it whatever you want to, but we're, we're never really going to know what happened. She went out to feed, and, and we called it murder, but for her, it was just survival. And Humbert, he was just trying to keep her safe. Well, well, you've got this prosecutor who just wants to fry somebody for murder. And Colin fit the bill, so it's... But it it's... was a giant killer insect. Absolutely. You really believe that? And you don't? You saw what happened. Bob got it on tape. Something flew out of that attic. Now look at me. There are monsters out there, and you saw one, and you know it. We're not sure what we saw, but the three independent entomologists' final word contacted were sure. They said this species of Caucasoma caucasus has never been known to grow to more than a size of seven inches. As far as DNA cross-matching is concerned, one entomologist called it the stuff of science fiction. But what we do know is Seth Hubbard confessed to killing his wife, Jimmy Dixon, as well as a homeless man whom he put in a makeshift cocoon, what prosecutors have called the demented pathology of a very strange serial killer. Colin Wales was free, free to mourn the friend he'd lost, free to go on with his life. Did you kill your wife, Mr. Hubbard? And that's the final word. Stay tuned for your local news and don't forget tomorrow morning on The First Word. Marie Santora and Jenna Wallace will have everything you need to know to start your day off right. Good night, everybody. The Final Word is brought to you by the Simpkins Group, insuring families for over 75 years, and by the Sanford Corporation, investments for a lifetime. Stay tuned now for your local news. You're hot. You're hungry. You're unhappy. Do I look fat? Listen up for cops. Then, for over 13 years, your viewer tips have helped America's Most Wanted capture 672 dangerous fugitives. But we're not stopping there. This week, help bring down... These guys are armed. These ruthless carjackers and end their reign of terror. They have no fear of death. You can help. All new America's Most Wanted. It all starts at 8, 7 central tomorrow on 